Amen. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 57. And the King James text today reads, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the same. Sorry. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Thanks be to God who giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to let you know today you can lose the battle but win the war. Hallelujah. Would you join me this hour for a moment of prayer? Master, Savior, Redeemer, King, we come to you once again, Lord. At this moment in our service as the Word of God is broken open, Lord, the bread of life is about to be shared with your people. And the one you have called and entrusted to share it is not but an earthly mortal man. I have no divinity. I have no skills. I have no special talent that would allow me, God, today to help the people of God better understand your word, better understand your truth, receive revelation and enlightenment today, except for the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Master, anoint today, God, your messenger. Lord, you know how much, God, I rely on the anointing, how much I believe in the anointing. Oh God, only a fool would step into the pulpit, the sacred desk of the Almighty, and think for even a moment they have anything to offer outside of your divine presence and power resting upon them, helping them to disseminate the Word of God. Oh God, today touch the ear of every hearer, those that are listening live, those who will later hear this message by reason of recording, let the anointing, the power of God be palpable. Let it be real. Convince us today, O oh God, of your truth. For we ask it in none other than Jesus. Wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. I preached a message last Sunday that I know a lot of fundamentalist and evangelical folks will gag on. I know a lot of people in the church today will choke and they will struggle with the word that I preached last Sunday. They will rail against it, Tommy, and they will claim it 
is not scriptural. It is not truth. But I'm here to tell you today, the truth of grace is a truth that is very hard to fathom. It is very hard to understand. And it is very hard to receive. Mankind likes to believe that if you have transgressed the law, if you've broken a rule, if you have offended, that the only way to set things straight is you have to do something in order to help tilt the scale back toward justice. There's this mindset. If you've wronged me, well, then you have to do something right by me in order to help me forgive you, in order to help me move past this. But grace is a reality. It is a truth that is so contrary to human nature. <laughs> well, there's a simple reason for that. Because grace is not human, it is divine. Hallelujah. Grace is an agent. It is something that only the divine can manifest and demonstrate. Only God could give favor where no favor is due. Only God could bless where no blessing has been earned. Only God could forgive when nothing has been done to merit that forgiveness. You see, that's, that's something only God can do. When we sing the old song, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found was blind, but now I see. We don't really fathom the depths and the riches of the grace of God. Grace is mingled with love. Grace has its foundation in love. The Word of God declares, For God so loved the world. The whole reason that God did what he did. The whole reason that Jesus Christ came and allowed himself to suffer on the cross of Calvary, allowed himself physically to lie dead in a grave for three days. The only reason the Lord did this was love. And that love has demonstrated itself to us in the form of what? Grace. And what does God call us to do to access that grace? He calls us to believe. Hallelujah. He said, just believe me. What I want you to do is believe me. Hallelujah. Oh, it's such a simple thing. But yet there are people in the church world today who are so hung up on a message that amounts to a works-based salvation message. Some might wonder today, Pastor, why do you preach in this vein as often as you do? Well, I've got news for you today. I've asked God that question myself many, many times. I, because, I, I listen, I've told you many times before, I seek the face of God for every message that I preach. If God doesn't give me a message, I won't get in the pulpit, literally. I remember pastoring my first church. There was one Sunday when God had not given me a message. And I got up in front of the people and I said, Right till this very minute, God has laid nothing on my heart. It was a Sunday night service. I said, right until this very minute, God has laid nothing on my heart to preach. Therefore, I have nothing to preach. I refuse. I, I come from old time Pentecostal stock. I believe if a man or woman of God is called of God, that they must wait before the face of God to receive a word, to deliver that word to God's people. You don't just pick a scripture out willy-nilly. You don't just pick something out and preach a little sermonette for Christianettes. That's not how this preacher believes. But I've asked the Lord even this week, I said, Lord... You have me so often preach on grace and you have me so often try to clarify 
the message of salvation as it compares to and contradicts, if I may say so, the message of salvation by works. And I said just this week, I said, Lord, why is that? <laughs> I literally asked God, I said, why is that? And the answer came back to me just as clear in my spirit as a bell. And the Lord said, because it's needed. Because the people of God, especially those of us, I say us, because I was raised in a fundamentalist Pentecostal church. Those of us who were raised in the legalistic fundamentalist movement, you know, the evangelical movement that preaches any number of thou shalt nots. And if you do any of these, then suddenly your name is crossed out of the book of life. Suddenly you find yourself no longer able to make heaven. Suddenly you're no longer uh, going to be included in the rapture. I was born and raised and taught as a child to believe that the slightest infraction. And boy, I mean, I could miss the rapture. So, I mean, if you got up one day and you were in a bad mood and you had a bad day and you said something you ought not have said or did something you ought not to have done and Jesus came that night, bless the Lord, you would miss the rapture. So you have to make certain that you're perfect and holy and you never miss the mark. And bless God, if you do, you better hit your knees and repent of it the moment that it happens because God is literally up in heaven with white out and he is ready to erase your name. He's ready to wipe your name out of the Lamb's book of life faster than he wrote it in. And that message of works related salvation, works oriented salvation has been so driven into the minds of God's people and into the spirits of God's people, the Lord said, that's why I have you talk about this as much as you do. See, Tommy, I don't just preach people happy. We could just have a Pentecostal church like every other Pentecostal church in America. We could just, you know, have a happy, go lucky, act like nothing's different and nothing's wrong church and just do things like so many other churches do. And I know there are churches in the LGBT community affirming churches. I know there are many and that's exactly what they do. They have a bunch of LGBT folks come together for church and they just ignore the issue that they're LGBT and they just have church the way Pentecostal people have church and they act like you know all is well with the world but they never address the all important issue that foundational issue that troubles so many who come from this movement does grace work for me does grace apply to me? No. They keep they stay in the same vein. You gotta do everything right. You gotta act everything. Here's the thing that cracks me up though. They preach one thing and then they do another, but I'm not even gonna get into that because that's just hypocrisy and garbage. And I'm not even going there. We're not even gonna talk about that. But God hasn't called me to a ministry that just does things like everybody else does it. I'm not even trying to imitate another affirming ministry. I'm not even trying to imitate another Pentecostal church. I'm trying to do and say and preach what God has called me to do and say and preach. In my primary text today, the Apostle Paul addresses to the church at Corinth the truth of the promise of the rapture of the church. Hallelujah. The catching away. Rapture is simply a word we use. It's a theological term. It's not found in the Bible, but it simply means catching away. 
It is the catching away of God's church from the earth. Because the judgment that is to come upon the world, which will last three and a half years, the first half of the seven-year tribulation is God's judgment on the church because the Word of God teaches that will not the judge of all the earth do right? The Word of God teaches that God will not judge the righteous with the wicked. Therefore, the Word of God teaches that judgment must first begin where? At the house of God. So judgment has to begin at the house of God. Ju God allows the church to be judged during the first three and a half years of the tribulation period. That is the time when things will be occurring in our world uh, that will shake the church down and it will cause the true believer to stand up and stand out and those who are only playing this game are going to fall by the wayside but then at the moment that the antichrist stands up in the temple declaring himself to be God the church is going to immediately be withdrawn and Jesus said then shall ye see tribulation such has never been said then the judgment of God is going to be poured out in the world like you have never seen honey it is going to be a horror movie become real it is literally going to be like a horror movie that has come to life you think you've seen some scary movies wait until the second half of the tribulation begins but the judgment of the world cannot begin until first the church has been removed because the word of God tells us God will not judge the righteous with the wicked. He has already judged the church first. And he does so to make us ready for the promise of his coming. Paul tells us in our primary text today, he said, I'm going to explain to you something that you may not generally understand. Behold, I show you a mystery. And he goes on to explain that many will have passed from this life by the time the Lord comes. He says, but the catching away of the church is going to be an instantaneous, momentary thing. It's going to happen in the blink of an eye. He said the dead in Christ will rise first and then the living in Christ will follow. He said, but there's a reason that all this has to take place. There's a reason why the rapture is necessary. Because God could easily just cause all of us to drop dead and then our spirit could wander on up to heaven, you know, and all would be well with the world. But Paul said something must transpire. He said, for this corruptible must put on incorruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. He said, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. He said, folks, I'm here to tell you. There's a purpose in the coming of the Lord. There's a purpose in the rapture of the church because between earth and heaven, something has to transpire. Between earth and heaven, listen to me children, between earth and God's holy city, something has to take place. Why? Why would something have to take place between earth and heaven. Well, it's simple. Because so long as we're bound by earth's atmosphere, and as long as we're bound by gravity, as long as we're bound by the rules of this universe, we are in sin. I talked about it last week. A lot of Christians hear me say that, and immediately their ire gets up. Oh, you're not supposed to say that, glory to God. Why, we Christians, we don't walk in sin. Baloney, you don't. You just don't acknowledge it, but you walk in it. So funny how 
we like to put the emphasis on certain scriptures and we like to play down others. Every denomination, every organization, every Christian, every believer emphasizes strongly certain passages of scripture and yet there are others that they play down. You know, uh, I call it weak and strong scriptures. Every denomination you go into, they have certain scriptures that they're strong about. And then there are certain scriptures they're weak on. Uh, you know, this passage over here, it, you know, it says what it says, and it's nice, and it's good. But they don't really glean anything deep from it. They don't really glean anything uh, of great importance from it. Because to them, it's a, it's a more passive scripture. Oh, but this one over here. Oh, no, 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 this one. Why, the Seventh-day Adventist. Oh, my God. Every scripture that has the word Sabbath in it. The Jehovah's Witnesses. Oh, when God tells Israel, this is my name and this is the name that you shall know me. Of course, forget the fact God's talking to Israel. That is the name Israel still knows him by. They don't recognize him as Jesus because the word of God said when he was among them, they didn't recognize him for who he was. Hello now. So yeah, Israel always will recognize God as Jehovah. They'll never recognize God as Jesus. We understand that. We know that. But there are certain scriptures that every movement, every organization is strong with. And there are other scriptures that, you know, they, 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 they might, you know, oh, they might preach that scripture because it hits a high note. Oh, it lifts people's spirits. It inspires us. Just like this scripture that I'm reading today. We shall not all sleep. But we shall all be changed in, the, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. When I was a kid, oh, I want to tell you, my goodness, today I'm having trouble, aren't I? When I was a kid, I can't even begin to tell you how often I heard this scripture quoted or this scripture referred to. But I'm here to tell you today, this scripture is a far deeper, stronger scripture than most people give it credit for. This is not just a scripture you refer to in order to uh, make people shout and get happy over the concept of the coming of the Lord. No, 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 no. There is a deep, powerful theological message in this scripture that too many in the church gloss over and they don't recognize and appreciate. And that message is... So long as we are in this life, so long as we are in this body, we are corruptible. So long as we are in this body, we are mortal. So long as we are in this body, we are subject to death, to physical death. But death is only the byproduct of sin. My Lord, even Paul said in our primary text today, the power of death, listen, he said, O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. Well, wait a minute. How does, how does the sting of death, which is sin, how does sin then affect the believer? Jesus said, He that believeth on me shall never die. He that believeth on me shall have everlasting life. So how then is it that death, which is related to sin, death is the penalty for sin, why then is it that believers still cannot step out in front of a bus, cannot put a gun to their head and blow their brains out and immediately walk away as if nothing had ever happened? Why is it that death then still has a grip 
on believers. Why is it that Jesus, God manifest in human form, was able to lay down his body on the cross of Calvary, and the word of God said that he submitted himself unto death, even the death of the cross. How is it that that was possible? Because death is directly related to sin. Didn't the Lord say to Adam in the Garden of Eden, in the day that thou eatest of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt surely die. So the transgression was directly related to death. So why do believers yet die? Well, it's easy. Paul explains in our primary text today. He said, we shall not all sleep. So not everybody's going to die physically when the, before the Lord comes. There will be some who are still physically living when the Lord comes. He said, but we shall all be changed. You see, Jesus said that he that believeth on me shall have everlasting life. And he did not mean that your spirit or your soul alone would have everlasting life. He meant you, 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 all that you are is going to live eternally. The only problem is your body, your heart, your mind, your organs have not been designed to last through eternity. Therefore, something must transpire between earth and heaven. And what is that? We must be what? Changed. There has to be a change that occurs. So we die because we're believers, but we have not yet been changed. Because we have not yet been changed, we are still subject to sin. Oh my goodness. The Apostle John said, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and we make God a liar. So if we say we have no sin, got news for you, church. Anybody fool enough, just because your hair is piled on your head and your dress is a certain length and your sleeves are a certain length and you don't put nail polish, lady, on your fingernails and you don't put a, a, a loud beard or a mustache, mister, to grow on your face. If you think that that makes you holy and that makes you sinless, May I speak plainly? You're an idiot. You are an idiot. I was in one of the greatest, largest, one God, Jesus name, apostolic denominations. I was going to start my first apostolic work. The pastor I'd been under for, oh, about a year and a half or so, uh, was trepidatious, I'll be nice about me starting work 20 miles up the road. He was an older man, and I guess he was afraid of losing people. I had had a radio program, and many people in uh, the church that I was part of really loved our radio program and loved what I was doing in that regard. And I guess he was terrified he might lose people. And so this man wanted to do everything in his power to prevent me from starting a church about 20 miles up the road. I called the district home missions director for the denomination. I'm going to be nice today. I'm not going to name it. I've done so in the past, but I'll be nice today. Spoke to him about what was happening, and he said, listen, if you start your church and you get up a dozen or two dozen people, he said, as long as you meet the standard of this denomination, he said, we then will be able to receive your church into our fellowship and that pastor's input won't have as much play. He said, but when it comes to church planting and church starting, uh, we have to give his, you know, input a lot more weight. So basically he was giving me a roundabout way to become part of that denomination. Said, you know, without uh, offending or hurting anybody, you know. 
Well, I went to my friend who was coming with me to start the church, and I told her what this man had told me. I did not expect that Blabbermouth was going to go out and tell the world what this man had told me, but she did. Next thing you know, this pastor calls this man, who is, mind you, the home missions director for the state of Texas in the largest, most well-known apostolic Pentecostal Jesus name, One God, Acts 238 preaching church denomination in the world. Did you tell Brother Charles thus and so? And do you know what that dear, sweet, short-haired, long sleeve don't wear nothing that the denomination said I shouldn't wear? Oh, I look holy. I can go to camp meeting. I can go to general assembly. And I can shout about being holy. Oh, I can shout about the holiness under the Lord. He told that pastor, no, I did not say that. That was a bald-faced lie. I wouldn't dare stand before God right now and make that accusation if it wasn't fact. Tommy, I'm not stupid. I'm not going to stand up here and say the man said something he didn't say. First of all, I didn't know that's how that denomination worked. So therefore, I wouldn't have known that except for him telling it to me to begin with, okay? But that man called me a liar. He called my integrity into question. He caused that pastor to then accuse me of being a liar because he would not stand behind his own word. I got news for you, high hair holiness folk. Don't you stand there and tell me that you're without sin. Don't you stand there and tell me that you're holy before God. No, many of you are tongue tattlers. Many of you are backbiters. Many of you are gossips. Many of you are liars. Many of you will cheat somebody if you're given half a chance. Many of you will do any number of things. Many of you will... Uh, uh, covet your neighbor's property. Many of you will lust after your neighbor's wife. Oh my God, have mercy. And you know it, if you'll be honest. Because as long as we're bound by flesh and blood, Tommy, we're subject to sin. That is the truth. Something must happen between earth and heaven. And that something is we must be changed. And Paul goes on to say, corruption must put on incorruption. Mortal must put on immortality. Actually, let me rephrase that. Corruptible must put on in corruption. You see, there's difference in the meaning of that. It's not a matter of when we say uh, corruptible must put on incorruption. That means that in this life, Satan can corrupt us. He can corrupt our mind. He can corrupt our thinking. He can cause us to think or do or encourage us to think or do things we ought not to do. But you know what? After you've been changed, the devil won't have that power over you. Hallelujah. You'll no longer be corruptible. Hallelujah. It's not about your body being able to uh, decay in the grave. No, because that's where mortality shall put on immortality. Mortality comes in when he said corruptible must put on incorruption. We know about corruption in government. We know about corruption in police departments. We know about corruption in the judiciary system. Oh, but in God's heaven, you ain't even going to be able to be corrupted. Hallelujah. Because God is going to share the divine glorified nature of Christ with us. The word of God said, tempted in all like manner as we, yet, what? Without sin. Jesus could not be corrupted. You couldn't corrupt him. You couldn't do nothing. You know, when I was a kid, my brother Michael told me this once, and I found it very flattering. He said, I was real proud to be your brother when we were in high school together. 
said, you know, I would tell people my name and they would say, oh, are you related to Chuck Morrow? And he'd say, yeah, he's my older brother. And Michael said, he, didn't, he couldn't count how many times somebody would say to him, man, that guy is such a goody two-shoes. I'm telling you what, you couldn't get him to do anything bad. You couldn't pay him money. You couldn't get him to do anything bad. Well, first of all, I'm going to tell you, I appreciate the compliment. I'm glad that was my testimony. It wasn't true, though, because God knows I did plenty of stupid things. I did plenty of sinful things, did plenty of idiotic things. Thank God they were out of sight of these people. But... You know, that was my reputation, though. You know, I tried, I strove, I, I really struggled to live the Christian life the best that I could. Were there areas where I was exceptionally weak? Absolutely. Were there areas where I was more inclined than other areas to do something stupid? Absolutely. If believers today in our world would be honest, they would acknowledge that as long as we are in a flesh and blood body, we are Corruptible. So this corruptible must put on incorruptible. Incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the same. That is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, then when we are changed, then the penalty of sin no longer applies to us. And we will not have to suffer the penalty of sin, which is what? Death. The soul that sinneth, what? It shall die. Isn't that what the word of God says? Oh my, then Paul said, shall be brought to pass the same that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh death, where is thy sting? Oh grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory, through our Lord Jesus Christ. What is Paul saying? He's saying as long as we're in this earthly body, as long as we're bound by gravity, as long as we're confined to this God-made, God-designed universe, we are subject to sin. We are subject to the penalty of sin, which is death. He said, oh, but thanks be unto God, which giveth us the victory. You may lose a battle now and then, but the victory is in God's hand. Hallelujah. And whether we lose a battle, whether we fail and falter, whether we slip and trip, it doesn't matter because the grace of God will carry us through and in the end we'll win the war. Hallelujah. Oh, thanks be unto God which giveth us the victory. Do you see where this portion of Scripture has a lot more meat in it than we often realize? In Romans chapter 7, verses 14 through 25, Paul writes, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal. What did he say? This mortal, carnal, must put on immortality. He said, but I am carnal, sold under sin. Sold under sin. What does that mean? It means I'm a slave to sin. Sold under sin. He's literally saying, I'm a slave to sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. 
Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. This is the Apostle Paul, one of the greatest men of God to ever walk planet Earth. Writer of two-thirds of the New Testament. And what is Paul here confessing? He's confessing, I'm a slave to sin. The things that I would do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, those are the things I'm doing. He said, but, but, oh, I wish more believers would understand this today. He said, but there's a little difference between me and the unbeliever. Because, see, as a believer, when I do it, it's not me that's doing it. But the sin that dwelleth in me. Oh. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Oh, wait. The Word of God said that believers don't sin. That once you're a child of God, that we no longer sin. That's right, we don't sin. Paul explains why. He said, because it's no longer I, but sin that dwelleth in me. You see, God views our transgressions differently than he views the transgression of the unbeliever. Why? Because of our faith. Because of our trust in him. He looks at our transgression differently. He said, no, Tommy isn't doing that. The sin that's in Tommy is doing that. Oh my God, have mercy. Charles isn't doing that. The sin that is in Charles is doing that. Do you follow what I'm telling you? Oh, but don't worry because the day is coming when they shall be changed. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me. He said, I have the will. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. He said, I have the will, but when it comes to finding a way to do what I know ought to do, I, I can't find it. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil... Which I would not. Listen. Listen to what Paul just said. He said the evil. We got people running around the world. Homosexuals are evil. These people are evil. Those people are evil. Um, excuse me. The apostle Paul confessed to doing evil. You know why? Because as long as you're bound by human form as long as you're in flesh and blood honey I got news for you today you're going to do evil he said listen for the good that I would I do not but the evil which I would not that I do now if I do that I would not if I do what I don't want to do it is no more I that do it but sin that dwelleth in me. This is the second time Paul says this. Are you following? How many churches have you been a part of that have explained this? How many churches you've been a part of have taken this as a strong scripture? Or did they just gloss over it and act like it doesn't even say what it says? No. As a believer, when you put your faith in God and you put your faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ, then God sees us through the eyes of mercy and grace and he sees us standing in the righteousness of Christ. Therefore, the things we do that are displeasing to him, he sees differently than he sees in an unbeliever. An unbeliever, he sees them in the flesh. The believer he sees how? In the spirit. For God looketh not after the outward appearance. Do you hear what I'm telling you? But God looketh where? Upon the heart. He continues. I find then a law, verse 21, a law that 
When I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. Oh, hallelujah. Paul, it's a good thing you delight in the law of God after the inward man. Because God does not look upon the outward man, but God looks where? Upon the heart. Oh, thank God, Paul, your heart is right with God. Thank God, Paul, you have the desire. Thank God, Paul, you have the will to do right. You have the desire to do right. You long to do right. You hunger to be holy. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. Verse 23, Romans 7. But I see another law in my members. Warring against the law of my mind. Listen. And bringing me into captivity. Oh my God. Preacher, you'd be thrown out of most fundamentalist churches. Surely you'd be thrown out of Pentecostal churches today. To dare suggest that we are brought into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members, meaning in my flesh, in my body. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. My, we're in a pickle, aren't we, as believers? We've got it rough, but it's even more rough when you go to church and some idiot preacher gets up and preaches you straight into hell because you're not perfect and you're not holy and everything you do isn't right and every decision you make isn't right and every word that comes off your lips isn't right and every action you take isn't right, even though that's what you'd like to do, even though that's what in your heart you want to do and you strive to do, and I tell them the truth, but they still preach you straight into a devil's hell. But that wasn't the message Paul preached. Now, Paul acknowledged our humanity has us by the small hairs. Remember when you're a kid, if somebody, the teacher wanted to get you, boy, all she had to do is take them little tiny hairs in the back of your neck. Man, those little hairs are small, but you let somebody grab them and yank on them, and they got control of your whole body because you're going to go along. Well, I got news for you today. Sin has you by the short hairs as long as you're in a human form. Now, this is not an excuse. To not strive for holiness. This is not an excuse. To not strive for godliness. No. We are called to pursue godliness. We're called to desire to be more like Jesus. But what this is today. This is an encouragement for us when we falter and when we fail. This is an encouragement for us when we happen to lose a battle now and again. Don't worry about losing the battle. You're still going to win the war. Hallelujah! Glory to God! It doesn't matter that you lost your battle yesterday. You're still going to win the war. Lastly, today in Titus 3 verses 1 through 6, the Word of God declares, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates or to obey the law, the legal representatives of the law, police, so on and so forth, judges, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not 
by works of righteousness which we have done. But according to His mercy, He saved us. By the washing of regeneration, which is baptism in Jesus' name, and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which is the baptism with the Holy Ghost, which He shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Isn't it funny? Just one second ago in Titus it reads, after that, the love of God our Savior toward man appeared. And then not even a verse later he says, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Isn't that funny? Which is it? Is God our Savior or is Jesus Christ our Savior? Got news for you. Throughout the entire Old Testament, God declares, I am the Lord, which by the way, the, the, the actual literal interpretation would be Jehovah. I am Jehovah, that is my name. And beside me there is no Savior. So God declares that He Himself is Savior, that there is no Savior, and it's interesting that he would use the language beside me. He said, there's no Savior beside me. Hallelujah. Therefore, Jesus Christ our Savior and God our Savior, hallelujah, are one and the same Savior. Glory to God. Verse 7, Titus 3, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Glory to God. I'm not saved because of works of righteousness, which I have done. Sadly, I'm a sinner saved by grace. I'm still in a sinful world. I strive, I struggle, I seek to live a godly, holy life. I try my best. Tommy can tell you. Uh, you know, there are times I've lost my top and blown it at somebody and had a, uh, uh, for lack of a better term, I got freak out session and just had my fill with somebody's foolishness and, and blown my gasket. And he can tell you, I struggle with that afterwards, don't I? Because I feel terrible. Why? Not because I think I'm going to go to hell for having doing it, but because that's not at all the way I want to act. That, that's not at all how I want to do. Amen. I want to be like Jesus. I don't want to be like that fool. But you see, God looks and says, that's all right, Charles, because what I see happening is I don't see you doing anything. All I see is the righteousness of Christ. That's all I see. But what I see is I see sin doing things. The sin that dwells in you. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? You see, it becomes separated from you. It becomes almost like the sin in you becomes another entity. And when you do wrong and you do evil and you do those things you ought not to do, God looks and says, oh, I, I, I saw a whole other person step out of you and do that. Oh, hallelujah. That's what grace does for us. That's what grace does for us. So you may lose the battle now and then. But you will win the war. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. But we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. Oh, the sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. I've lost many battles, but I have full confidence in God that I'm going to win the war. Mm -hmm.